Open your Bibles to uh, Matthew 23. We're looking at Hosea still, and uh, you notice the title tonight is Hosea, the God who gathers. God is not the God who scatters. He is the God who gathers. Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 23, verses uh, 37 and 38. Jesus had just, uh, just told the scribes and the Pharisees and the other people in the crowd uh, what all they had done to deserve that the, ju- the punishment that was to come. And then he says this. He, he says that, uh, let's start in verse 36. It says, Assuredly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That's a horrible pronouncement, if you, know, if you understand what that means. But he didn't stop there. In verse 37 he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. So, when Jesus lamented over the uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, because remember he explained to the to the uh, uh, to his disciples, they, you know, they were marveling at the temple and, and, the, and the grounds around there. And he said, he said, you see all these big stones? There won't be one left upon another one. They'll all be torn down. And you know that had to very bring a huge surprise to them because it took a long time to put those stones in place. And, and the implication was they're going to be torn down in a moment. And we know what happened is, you know, in 70 A.D., the Romans finally had enough of what was going on with rebellion among the Jewish people, and and they hired mercenaries, and they tore that place to pieces. They did not leave one stone. That was the order. Do not leave one stone upon the other. And they just wiped it out. But the fact that he lamented over the, the, the uh, destruction of Jerusalem reveals the heart of God. God never wants to see us go through any destructive things. And and he's always trying to bring us back, as we learned last time, you know, that that, that, uh, Hosea, he told Hosea uh, to live this life, you know, marry this prostitute or harlot, as you know, King James says, and and that his life would be a demonstration of, of what God is doing with Israel and actually to all people because he included the Gentiles in that when we got to the end of chapter 2. And, and uh, that he was showing that, you know, he, he called, he said concerning the Gentiles that the people that are not named or are people that are no people or people that don't count, is the way we'd say it in our modern vernacular, will be called the sons of God. So, and he said that he said concerning their their bad behavior that he was going to woo them or draw them back that you know he would love on them and cause them to want to come back and uh, something that has been taught within within the church is that uh, and I, I used to hear this when I was a new Christian I haven't heard it lately but I used to hear it but well we need to pray that you know they'll just hit the bottom because that and then they'll then they'll give their life to the Lord. No, that's cursing people. We don't want to curse people. We want to bless people. And the Bible says it's the goodness of God that causes men to repent, not the judgment. (laughs) Because, now think about this. All the people that that will eventually go to hell, they're, they're living, they will be existing in judgment. And they will never repent. So if judgment's a good idea, you know, like some people say, some preachers say, if judgment's a good idea, then why don't those people ever repent? 
And, and people say, well, they can't. They won't. It's not that they can't. They won't. Okay? So, so we need to know about good things. And, and Jesus said, you know, I wanted to gather you. So God desires to gather us to him because he wants to show us his love for us. It's like kind of like what we experienced tonight. God was showering us with his love. I mean, it was just wonderful. And, and so, so uh, if you'll go back to Hosea, please. So God told Hosea to marry this uh, harlot in uh, Hosea 3.13. Three thirteen, four thirteen. I'm sorry, because <laughs> there is no three thirteen. Says they they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and they burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. So God had told told uh, Hosea to marry the the harlot. And he wanted to show that he demonstrates his love towards us. And, and right here, he, he's talking about what they have done to bring things down upon their head. Not that he wants it, but because this is what you've done. And, and uh, I, I, you can believe whatever you want to, but I don't, I have never being able to reconcile the idea of God bringing horrible things upon people and then turning around and loving them. God doesn't have to bring horrible things upon people. There's a devil here. <laughs> and he'll do all that you want. He hates people. He despises people because every time he looks at a human being, he sees the image of God and he doesn't like it. Okay? So, so God doesn't have to bring anything. All he has to do is back up and the devil swoops in. And, and he doesn't back up to, so the devil can punish us. He backs up because he has to. Because of what we're doing. We're pushing him away. So uh, the judgment thing, there is, there is a final judgment and it will be shown to men why the reason why they're going to be in the place that they're in, but the constant cry of heaven is, return to me. Return to me. You know, I, I believe that when Jesus stood upon that hill and, and he called out to Jerusalem, I, I do not believe he was just speaking and had no emotion. I believe that, that it was something that was tearing at his heart. That he had, you know, he had sent because you have to remember, Jesus, under, Jesus understood everything about himself by Scripture. He carried no knowledge of heaven with him when he was born in the earth. Amen. And, and that should be encouraging to us because people get this, you know, they have these ideas about Jesus and, and his divinity that, you know, well, he just had it all and he could have done anything if he just wanted to. And, and from the standpoint of could he have, yes, but then it would have ruined the plan of God. You know, he, in other words, he had the power to do so, but he had not the will to do so. Okay? So, so if Jesus discovered who he was, and you remember Jesus said that he didn't do anything except that the Father showed him. And then when he got to the end of his life, as a matter of fact, after he was resurrected, he said, go do what I did. Well, you can't go do what he did if he did it as God. That wouldn't be fair, because we're not God. <laughs> so we, so he, you know, as the Bible says, he was a man anointed, and that's how he was able to do things. So because God is a God of mercy, he is continually trying to return us to him. Now, back up to verse 4, it says, now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. <laughs> as, as a preacher, I know what that is. People walk up, you know. I, I, I rarely experience things here in Kirkland. Uh, every once in a while, but not very often. 
I mean, I mean, it's few and far between, and it's and it's never, and never has a, a tone of malice to it. It's always more of a I don't get it kind of thing. Where when I pastored in in another place, people would walk up to me, and even other churches when I was traveling, people would walk up to me after the service. Why did you say that? And they are not happy, and they're wanting to tell me why. And I believed. Now they wouldn't quote scripture; they just tell me what they thought. And you know me, you've heard me say this, that, you know, okay, well, give me scripture for that. Well, they couldn't. So, so if you can't give me scripture, I'm not going to go with you. So anyways, <laughs> let's get back to where we're at. They are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore, you shall stumble in the day, and the prophet shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. So bad things are going on. Not only are the people rebelling against the, the, the preachers, the preachers aren't acting right either. Okay? My people, this is, a, this is a verse of scripture that a lot of people know, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me, because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your people. So, so even though the people are being on me, who does God put the responsibility on? The priest or the priesthood. And, and it's a difficult, let me tell you, it is a difficult thing to lead people in righteousness. You understand what I mean by that? You, you know, you, you can preach to people, you can lead and you can live, you know, live the best you can, you know, to lead, lead a, a godly example and people fight anyway. <laughs> and, and, and sooner or later, uh, if, if a, if a, uh, and you should also, you should also understand, you should pray for me whenever you think of, you know, whenever my face flashes in your brain or whatever, pray, you know, say a little prayer, God keep him. Because the problem is, is, is what happens is people start misbehaving and, and if preachers don't watch it and don't guard their hearts, they start taking that upon themselves and then they start getting the idea of, well, this is a waste of time. You know, I've, I've preached, I've, I've prayed, I've tried to live the life, you know, to show people how you want them to live, God, and they're not behaving, so they give up. Okay, they don't guard their heart. But God puts, but God puts the responsibility upon the priesthood, even though it is difficult to lead people. You know, like, I, like you know, the expression goes, sometimes it's like herding cats. It doesn't work very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so God rejected uh, the judgment of the people and the priest because they both forgot the law. Okay? So it's lack of knowledge. The reason why destruction comes upon people is because they don't know. If you know God and you know what he'll do, you won't reject him. You won't rebel against him. You won't do the things that will bring destruction upon yourself. Now, Lack of knowledge is destructive. It's very destructive. Or like what, what uh, one of my uh, teachers in Bible school used to say, ignorance is no blessing. <laughs> it's a, you know, people say, well, once I know, because they hate, you know, people will, will discover sooner or later God holds you responsible for what you know. And then people, some people say, well, then I don't want to hear. No, ignorance is no blessing. So, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Uh, King James puts it this way, In those days there was no open vision, or people weren't seeing God. And, and what it means is, is that because people were not uh, were not lining up with the word of God and not obeying the word of God and rebelling against the priesthood and then and then the consequence of all that is God just wasn't showing up. They, were, they weren't having words of the Lord. You know the the job of the of the prophet, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, was was to speak forth the will of the Lord so that the people would stay in the blessing of God. 
Well, if they're not seeing anything or they're not hearing anything, the people are not going to stay there. The same thing is true of the church. If the, if the, if the uh, you know, the book of Revelation says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in other words, if we are not prophesying, we are not testifying. And people will not come into the grace and the presence of God because there is no open vision or no revealed knowledge coming to them. You know, I'm sure you all have been in church services where it's just so dead and dry and boring. And, you know, that doesn't often happen in Pentecostal churches. It does happen, but not as often. But if you go to, you know, the more main mainline churches, if God ever shows up, you don't know it. You don't feel anything, you don't sense anything, and you don't hear much of anything either. Might as well be reading out of the Reader's Digest for all the information they're giving out. And I've even heard of, of pastors that have done that. I'm going to read the Reader's Digest today. You know, oh my God, time to find a new church, you know. <laughs> so, so lack of knowledge is, dis, is so destructive but the reason why people reject the Spirit of God is because they're ignorant of the benefits. So we must lead people into His presence, or you could say it this way, we must lead people into the supernatural because people don't naturally find the supernatural. Because the natural and the supernatural do not find each other. Okay? So, so, we, so we need to, you know... Um, I, I like what Jack Hayford used to say. We need to contend for the supernatural. And to contend, that, that was an overused word for a while there back in the 80s. But to contend means that we're always putting it in front of people. This is what we are. This is what we do. We demand the presence of God. We, we want to move with the Spirit. We want to see Jesus' hand move in and among the people. We want the blind to see, the, the, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear and the dumb to talk. We want those things within our midst. Amen. But but if but if we reject the supernatural and the vision goes away, the, the, the open vision, the revelation of God goes away, we will neither see nor do those things. You know, one of the things I, I told God, I've never said this to you all before. One of the things I told God in, in starting this church is, is it has to have the, the reputation of this is where people go to get healed. Do you think it upset him? No. <laughs> Amen. So, back up to verse 1. So, we must lead people into his presence. You know, we can say this without reservation. The church is the earthly representation of heaven. So, if we're not supernatural, we're not representing. Hello? Verse 1 says this. Hear the word of the Lord you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Isn't that interesting? There is no truth or mercy because there's no knowledge. The greatest revelation through the church is the grace of God. The greatest revelation through the church is the grace of God. Undeserved favor. We don't deserve it, but we get it. We get it because Jesus died for us. And, 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 and have you, you've noticed this, I know, you, when you talk to people that don't know the Lord, they're always looking for an exception to that. You know, they say, well, what about murderers? What about thieves? What about this? What about that? Will God forgive this? Will God forgive that? Yeah, anything. Well, what if they, you know, killed 100 people? Doesn't matter. There's got to be a limit to that. And, you know, what if it's 1,000? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, 
if you get the thought, you should tell people every so often, now be careful with this, but it is true, a murderer wrote half the New Testament. The Apostle Paul. And what do you mean he was a murderer? Whenever you desire to get people killed, whether it's by your hand or through other devices, you're a murderer. Okay? And that's what he was doing. He had letters. We know, remember when he was going to Damascus? He had letters to commit them, people to take them, and they were going to get killed. Okay? So he was a murderer. And God used him. You know, one of the things that we need to learn as a church is we need to learn to treat each other and others as the next potential Paul. You know, we have this tendency to look at people and, well, they're a mess, so they're only going to get so far. You don't know what God's going to do. You don't know what God's going to do. There's, there's a, you know, I don't know if he's still alive. I think he is. Uh, there was a guy that was part of a gang in New York, and, and uh, part of his testimony is before he came to Jesus, he held a, a teenage girl while another member of his gang, he was the leader of the gang, he held this girl so she couldn't move and get away, held her while the other guy lined up in front of her with a shotgun and blew her head off. Now that's gruesome. But he's led thousands of people to the Lord after he got saved. The same guy that held this girl. Now what does he deserve? According to our law, he deserves death. They should have pulled the plug on him a long time ago, right? He was never charged and convicted, though. He was never even charged for that deal. So, so you know, if God can take somebody that heinous, and we look at people that, well, you know, they steal a little bit or, or, you know, maybe they have a drug problem or alcohol problem or something like that. And we think, you know, and compared to holding somebody still so the other guy can blow their head off, that, that drug and alcohol thing ain't that bad. There is not to be judgment in the church. Ever. Well, we can judge their fruit. Be careful. Be careful with that one. Be careful. The number one reason why people lash out is because they're hurt. So, are they a mess also? Well, of course. But do they deserve grace? Well, if I do, they do. Amen? So, Grace and mercy are partners. They bring life to the unlearned. It's the unlearned that reject God, right? So in, in Hebrews chapter 4, if you'll turn there, how much time do I got? Golly. <laughs> we spent some time in the presence of God and shortened up my speaking time, but that's all right. We'd rather have God to have his way, Amen. So Hebrews chapter 4, verses uh, 15 and 16 say this, for we, can, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Isn't that wonderful? Part of the reason why Jesus came here is so he'd know what we're experiencing. He couldn't experience it in heaven. He could see it and he knew about it, but he couldn't experience it. You hear that? He could see it and he knew about it, but he could not experience it until he took on flesh and walked on the earth. He didn't know what it was to be. He didn't even know, for example, he didn't know what it meant to be hot or cold. You don't have that in heaven. You don't get hot or cold. Perfect. Amen. You don't, you don't have, you know, flesh having a fit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, whoops, where am I at? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So grace and mercy are partners. Grace and mercy are partners. 
So here's, here's the question. Will God excuse sin, any sin? Well, here's the answer. First of all, Jesus died for sin, not sin. Sin. Because we're all born into sin. He died for sin, not sins. Okay? And so, if Jesus went, and we know he did, if Jesus went to the cross to receive the punishment for our sin, is there anything unforgivable? No. Well, what about the unpardonable sin? That's a diff, that, that, that takes time to explain. There's qualifications and conditions. And yes, if you want to be honorary enough to get there, you can, but you got to get saved first. A sinner cannot do the unpardonable sin. Unpardonable sin. A sinner cannot do the unpardonable sin. Okay? So, so Jesus took upon this, all this stuff. So, <laughs> what causes us to get to that place of judgment? Lack of knowledge about the will of God. The will of God is to save us, to rescue us, to gather us up, not to throw us off into hell. So people need knowledge of sin, even though God will excuse anything. They need knowledge of sin. They don't need our judgment. I cringe every time somebody tells me the story of how some knuckleheaded Christian told them how they ought to dress for church or something like that, and they, you know, well, I just can't go then. You understand what I'm saying? I, you know, like my dad, he he walked into a church a few years ago, and somebody, one of the one of the deacons of that church, walked up to him and said, "Why well, aren't you wearing a suit?" And my dad said, "There's nothing wrong with the way I look. You dress like you see him when he comes here. You know, nice jeans and a, you know, nice white button-down western shirt. And of course, he has a little hat on because he was in the hallway, not in the sanctuary. He takes it off when he gets in there." And, and the gall of that person to say something like that to him, he said, well, I'm not going back there. And he was right. There's no reason to go back there unless God tells you to. Amen. So, so people don't need judgment. They need, to know, they need to know what sin is, but they don't need our judgment. Look at verse 11. It says, harlotry wine and new wine enslave the heart. Did I tell you to go back to Hosea 4? No. Okay, go back to Hosea 4. Harlotry, harlotry, <laughs> that's obviously a word I don't use every day. Harlotry, wine and new wine enslave the heart. So write these things down. Harlotry equals false love. You know, like the old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Wine equals false anointing. If you notice that when the, when the Holy Spirit settles on you in a powerful way, you kind of buzz. <laughs> and, and when you drink, if you drink, you know, uh, when we were in high school, we used to talk about being buzzed. I'm buzzed. You know, we didn't want to admit we were drunk. We all were. But we'd say, well, I'm just buzzed. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, but but it's, it's a false representation of what God wants to do for us. And it brings destruction. And then the new wine equals false security. False security. False security. So God's desire is to free enslaved hearts. The reason why people get involved with substance abuse is because their heart's enslaved. And, and I, you know, I used to argue this way before I knew better, and, and, and I, I hear it still being argued even by Christians. Well, you know, the re anybody can say no. You can't if your heart's enslaved. You just yield. To it. Well, you can say no. You don't have the will to. 
That's why them, if they had the, if an alcoholic had the will to quit drinking, he would. But they can't will themselves out of it. Their heart's enslaved. They, 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 they're, they're bound. They're captured. They can't get out except that the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. This is why, you know, we're, if, if someone goes to a church that doesn't really uh, follow, follow with the power of God, well, let's just speak plainly. If, the, if people go to a church where the power of God is not present, their chances of getting set free from alcoholism and drugs and other things that have ensnared them is slim and none. Because you don't teach people that out of that. You have to get them set free. You have to get them set free. Why? Because their heart is enslaved. And only, only the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. You can't teach people out of it. Good manners. I've met people with impe impeccable that's a word I don't use every day either. Impeccable manners who are just completely enslaved by things. It takes the anointing. So God desires to free the heart that are enslaved and to open the eyes of the unlearned. So let's finish with this. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Rowena said something interesting to me on the way down here. She said that, that need is everywhere, and it is. You don't have to look for need. It's, a, it's all over the place. You have to be led, or, you can, or you'll wear yourself out chasing need. You have to be led, or you'll wear yourself out. You, you know, you'll spend your money, you'll you'll give stuff away, you'll do you know all kinds of things. We shouldn't do anything unless God leads us. Amen. Well, it's already in the Bible. No, that's need. That stuff you're identifying as that's need. Those are needs. You can see them all over the place. People are broke. People are drugged. People are on alcohol. People are have problems with sex, and you know what? There's just all kinds of stuff. Some people are just ignorant, period. And they have all kinds of trouble because they don't know anything. Okay? And you can chase those needs all day long. But if God didn't tell you to, you're probably wasting your time. And people will say, well, you know, they'll say something like, well, what about Mother the Teresa? Look, oh, she's over there with the lepers and everything. God told her to. She didn't get that from the Bible. In other words, she didn't read, you know, because what about, what about all the stuff she, 